Modern Warfare. Two words that apart don't mean a whole lot, but together are legendary. The Modern Warfare franchise is without a doubt a cornerstone in Call of Duty's history, and depending on who you ask, is synonymous with the brand. Modern Warfare is Call of Duty. Rooted in history and so much critical acclaim and fan love, this year's upcoming title of Modern Warfare is a daring expedition as so many fans have high hopes for the game. While all we can do is wait and see where we'll be in a few months' time, I thought it's only fair to take a look back at the franchise, its humble origins, its unimaginable success, and every step of the way to where we are right now. A soft reboot to recapture the love players once had for the Call of Duty franchise. This is the complete evolution of Modern Warfare. If you enjoy what you see, feel free to drop a like, and if you'd like to see more Modern Warfare content, maybe considering that subscribe button to stay up to date daily. That said, let's begin. 50,000 people used to live here. Now it's a ghost town. November 6th, 2007, a date that would forever change the lives of the Infinity Ward team, the Call of Duty franchise, and the gaming industry as a whole. November 6th was launch day on the tremendously different yet hotly anticipated Modern Warfare. Up until this point, Call of Duty had only dealt with World War II shooters and stuck to the core values of what the brand knew. In fact, they stuck to the mold so much that Modern Warfare nearly was never Modern Warfare. But that's a whole story that we've discussed before and isn't required to know fully. But utilizing mainstream appeal, Call of Duty marketed Modern Warfare to be the game. The game that you were truly missing out on if you didn't take part in it, and sure enough, you were. From the sheer brilliance of the campaign following the rising coup in the Middle East, led by Khaled al-Assad, the Russian civil war between the ultra-nationalists and the government, and the growing forces led to bring order to the world, introducing us to the likes of Captain John Price, portrayed brilliantly by Billy Murray, John Soap McTavish, Gaz, and many more. And with the addictive multiplayer that followed that campaign's route, it was a game that revolutionized the first-person shooter genre at the time. The narrative, as we just mentioned for its iconic pieces, was equally riveting and was easy to get lost in. It was a game that bolstered itself to be ripped from the headlines, a story that was rooted in believable fiction. At the time, none of the things mentioned were really ever too far removed from the possibility of it happening in reality. The game teetered on the minds of all who played it and gave a sense of realism and plausibility to the story that they were buying into, fully immersing the player in what was written. As for the addictive side of multiplayer, it was simple, yet so very fun to play. You didn't need to be incredibly tactical to thrive, you didn't need to have 100% clear comms with your team, it just came down to you, your gun skill, and sometimes your ability to twitch aim, reactionary to the environment and the players around you. With a simple loadout system, 357 killstreaks that were effective and memorable, along with maps that to this day are some of the most iconic in the entire gaming world, what wasn't there to love? Consider that and then introduce the classics of the Call of Duty sphere in terms of weaponry and you had a full meal on your hands. The M4A1, M16, AK-47, MP5, Mini Uzi, M4003, you name it. It was a sight for sore eyes. Sure, looking back at some of the things now, there certainly were things that were broken. The M16, absolutely insane. The hit reg, decent at best. But I'm sure that you could name a half dozen things that may have irritated you, but at the same time, could you really imagine COD 4 without them? Later on, we had our first map pack for multiplayer, which introduced players to the maps of Broadcast, Chinatown, Creek, and Kill House, bringing more content outside of the box for players for the first time in Call of Duty's recent history. The culmination of all these factors, all these features, as a breakaway from a traditionally World War II-centered title, made for a breakout success for the Call of Duty franchise, and set it up for the coming years of wild growth and even wilder memories for a large portion of the coming player base. Tomorrow. There will be no shortage of volunteers, no shortage of patriots. I know you understand. Coming off the heels of World at War, another World War II game, but one that had great mainstream appeal despite not pushing the boundaries like COD 4 had in terms of breaking out of the comfort zone for Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 2 looked to pick up right where COD 4 left off. I don't recall any sense of misplaced skepticism, no one being like, well, they can't top that, like many may often do now, but I do recall a tremendous amount of excitement from a growing community. Modern Warfare 2 may have been what many considered the prime, the golden year of Call of Duty, though of course that's subjective and the likes of Black Ops, Modern Warfare 3, and Black Ops 2 in the three years to follow certainly put up a good case for their own. But Modern Warfare 2 really capitalized on the wave of success coming to the franchise, bolstering an amazing campaign, a truly next level multi player at the time, one of historic standards, and a brand new third mode entitled Spec Ops. It was a complete package. 
Modern Warfare 2's campaign is one for the ages, though truth be told, the entire original trilogy is. But following the events of Modern Warfare and COD 4, the scene is more tense, the ultranationalists of Russia have gained control, they've used Zakaev as a martyr and their views grow among the population, all while Vladimir Makarov comes to power, committing acts of terrorism all throughout Europe, and as you start to get your bearings on the campaign at hand, one mission in particular, No Russian, blows your thoughts on the entire storyline wide open. Controlling CIA operative Joseph Allen, you're a part of Makarov's inner circle, and mow down civilians at Zakaev International Airport, a scene that caused much controversy but also set up the entire campaign to follow. In the events to follow, there's so much, but memorably, you reunite with Captain Price, you fight back on the invasion of Washington, D.C., you try to locate Makarov's intel and in the process lose Roach and Ghost and ultimately chase down Shepard and kill him. The entirety of the storyline is a roller coaster and like COD 4 before, it transports you into the story. You're attached and to this day, though still kind of a meme, there's no shame in saying you were, at the very least, saddened when Ghost was killed off in loose ends. The entire story leaves you with so much to wrap up, but in its own right, the story was nothing short of iconic. Multiplayer reinvented itself within Modern Warfare 2 in a number of ways, though perhaps most notably was the killstreak system. Like we mentioned for COD 4 Modern Warfare, the game no doubt had its high points of amazing fan favorite weapons, absolute classic perks, legendary maps, and all that would go along with it, but the killstreaks were a reinvention of the wheel, and one that really worked. Up until this point, Modern Warfare and World War utilized the very simple but sweet 357 killstreak system in which you got a UAV or a recon spy plane, an airstrike, and a helicopter or dogs. But introduce Modern Warfare 2 and you have a plethora of different killstreaks that you could choose. If you wanted to use something one game and something else the next, you could. If you wanted to stack up on lethals, you could. If you wanted to play it short and sweet with a UAV, counter, and a care package, you could, but let's not forget the most revolutionizing and also most iconic piece to that killstreak puzzle, the tactical nuke, the 25 killstreak 24th hardline that ended the game and awarded your team a victory no matter what the score was up until that point. It was, simply put, legendary. There was simply no other way to put it. Not to mention it was relatively easy to do. That legendary 7-11-25 setup, well, if you know, you know. Killstreaks would count towards those next killstreaks, making it nuke hunting all day. Not to get too far into a tangent, the multiplayer was just simply addicting, and one that to this day is considered perhaps the gold standard of Call of Duty. From the weaponry, the maps, the killstreaks, even to the 12-year-old kid who totally should have been in school that ended up saying that he and your mom Yeah, it was, simply put, all superb. Spec Ops was that final piece to the puzzle in Modern Warfare 2's picture. Spec Ops was introduced in the game as a result of the insanely popular Zombies third mode in World at War. That mode caught fire out of something that truthfully was never even greenlit but was made under the radar, and to keep up with that third mode in particular, Spec Ops was introduced. This mode in and of itself was awesome in the sense that you could race the clock, you could go for more objectives against bots, or play with your friends to expand further outside of just that traditional MP experience, but I think it's safe to say that it didn't catch as much fire as Zombies did. It certainly had its niche and cult following, and I know some people who swear by Spec Ops, and don't get me wrong, it is absolutely fantastic, but it was a simpler of the third modes. And even though it was, it certainly did round out the complete package that Modern Warfare 2 was beautifully. Sure what the hell is he talking about? Get out now! Modern Warfare 3. The peak, but also potentially the end of an era. Modern Warfare 3 to this day still holds the single record for most sales in the Call of Duty franchise in terms of units sold. If you want to talk other statistics, things like COD Mobile now holds the most downloads with over 100 million in the first week, Black Ops 3 holds the most generated revenue from post-launch content and others, but if we're talking the simple baseline of what matters, those game sales, how many people were truly a part of that history of Modern Warfare, and even the Call of Duty franchise, well Modern Warfare 3 was as good as it got. Logged to date, 30.71 million sales of the game. That means that 30.71 million users got access to the finale of the campaign trilogy to last a lifetime, the multiplayer that once again redefined what we knew our addictive multiplayer experience to be, and another continuation of Spec Ops with a fan favorite survival added in. All of this while post-launch content offered a regular monthly basis for elite and non-elite members. This was, to many, the peak of Call of Duty, the game that will never be topped and with good reason for thinking that. 
Modern Warfare 3's campaign brought with it a final resolution to the story that had been going on for the past three and a half years or so, but it wasn't one that you'd reach without being put through the ringer, both in terms of narratively and also the team at Infinity Ward pulling at your heartstrings for the characters you knew to grow and love during those years. As the Russian invasion of the United States continued, early on you saw yourself fighting in Lower Manhattan, defending New York City setting up the story to chase down Makarov and prevent the global disasters from expanding in World War III. As the war ended between the United States and the Russians, the final steps are taken to end it all as Price and Yuri make their way to the Oasis Hotel in Dubai to hunt down Makarov. And perhaps the most memorable scenes of the game's storyline come from this mission in particular, in which you take out the pilot and co-pilot of Makarov's getaway helicopter, and as it crashes on the roof, Price is then saved by Yuri, who sadly isn't saved in return, but it gives Price enough time to wrap the cabling from the crash around Makarov's neck and allowing him to break the glass ceiling with his beatdown, thus hanging Makarov and ending the conflict three games in the making, fully concluding with Price sparking a cigar. A quick resolution and a fitting one to the narrative that fans grew to love over the years. Multiplayer for Modern Warfare 3 again saw itself reintroduced with another adjustment to the streak system, but this time instead of kill streaks, firstly, we saw point streaks. As well, instead of just kill streaks, we saw strike packages in which you could use your point streaks for kill streaks of more lethal nature or a support package for those that wouldn't reset and would allow you to wrap your streaks for things like ballistic vests, SAM turrets, and more. Along with an assault and support package, you had the introduction of Specialist, a system in place that instead of kill streaks or supporting items, you'd get perks for each new tier that you hit, with a Specialist bonus kicking in at 8 points or 7 with Hardline, which granted the player all perks save for a few that would modify your entire loadout. The nuke made a return in some capacity, this time as the Moab, in which you didn't end the game but instead kept your kill streak going, and it simply wiped out the entire enemy team upon calling it in. A streak that helped popularize the pub stomping community, in which you saw crazy records like five Moabs in one game happen. Weaponry again was popular with weapons like the ACR, the AK-47, the SCAR, the UMP-45, the P-90, the MP-7, the Barrett 50 Cal, the L-11, MSR, Desert Eagle, FMGs, and many, many more. These weapons and the loadouts were expanded upon, bringing players new features like weapon proficiencies, which were essentially perks built specifically for your weapons. Throughout all of this, one constant remained in the sense that maps, well, they were absolutely legendary as many came to expect with Modern Warfare's franchise. Maps like Dome, Village, Hard Hat, Arcaden, Resistance, all absolute icons in the franchise. Put it all together and you had a complete package spread out amongst other things like fan favorite standards of TDM, Search and Destroy, things like that, but also newer things like Infected, One in the Chamber, and the likes of modes of Face Off, 1v1, 2v2, and 3v3 matchups that pitted players against each other for the ultimate bragging rights to pave the way for some fun times with friends. Spec Ops continued from Modern Warfare 2 having become a staple to the Modern Warfare game seemingly, but instead of just having the mode with missions like you did in Modern Warfare 2, instead Modern Warfare 3 added a new niche mode to the game, survival. This was similar to zombies in that direct competition way, but also added a neat little twist which grabbed players' attention for sure. Along with the increasing waves of regular enemies mixed with juggernauts, dogs, bombers, you and your crew could end up buying weaponry, ammo, killstreaks, and the likes to help you fend off the enemies for as long as you possibly could. It offered a different feel to the community, who may have been reeling in an off year for zombies, and it offered a new way to come back and play Spec Ops for those that may be looking for just a little bit more replayability. On top of all of that, the complete package of campaign, multiplayer, and Spec Ops, Modern Warfare 3 changed the way the game handled its content distribution post-launch as well. While at the time season passes weren't really a thing, Call of Duty introduced the Elite program, a system that would allow you to dive deep into your stats, community features, and even Modern Warfare 3's version of theater, allowing you to have more slots to upload your clips and games. But along with that came the integration of post-launch content support, which saw content dropping every single month of the year. Some offering more, some offering less. But there was always content drop for Elite members, a month later for Elite members on PS3, two months later for non-Elite members on Xbox, and three months later for non-Elite members on PS3. Now, while that exclusivity window is kind of absurd, the content kept flowing throughout the entirety of the year, offering up multiplayer maps, spec ops missions, as well as face-off maps. There was always something to do, and always something to come up. The package was just about as complete as you could get. This is Bravo 6, we're on our way out! On your feet, soldier! We are leaving! 
I thought it only right to mention Modern Warfare Master because, well, not only sharing the likes of the name in the exact game as the original COD 4, Modern Warfare Master was also that revitalization of Modern Warfare's franchise on current generation consoles. Sure, it may not have been born out of the best circumstances, that being a failsafe or backup plan to Infinite Warfare, a game that was so terribly received that it held the record for, and if I'm not mistaken, still holds the record for the most disliked trailer on all of YouTube, and to this day is still sitting at number 6 on the all-time most disliked video list, peaking of, at the time, number two on that list. But Modern Warfare Remastered was tethered to Infinite Warfare for sales, but along with that came a great job done by Raven on the game. While it was just like the original in Campaign and MP, it also introduced things seen in today's Call of Duty titles into the classics. While it might not have been everybody's cup of tea, especially compared to some systems out there, the additional content added was done in a reasonable manner and in one that added more replayability to the game that you'd probably already put days into a decade before, while being respectful to that legacy that it built up. Collections were added into the game to make way for easy access to items and direct paths to earn new weapons that were added in throughout the year of Modern Warfare's shared year of support with Infinite Warfare. The variety map pack came along with the game a little later down the line to complete that road of content we'd seen in COD 4 all the way back, and much more. On top of adding things in like collections and supply drops, Modern Warfare Mastered also added a few variations to things that we didn't really consider beforehand. We saw things like the surprising return of Winter Crash, which was previously a PC variation. We saw things like Beach Bog, a thematic changeup for the Days of Summer event, things like Daybreak, the St. Patrick's Day themed variation of Downpour. We saw things like Regal and Exclusion Zone as top tier camos that the original game never saw, given the love for grinding camos in recent games. Game modes like Slash and prop hunt were added in that never made it officially into the original despite some being fan-made and even modded to be playable in the original but modern warfare remastered was a great touch of the old mixed with the new and for many was a sight for sore eyes if you can't identify the target you are the target and so here we are today just a few weeks out from the launch of the next installment of the Modern Warfare franchise, though a soft reboot of what we know. The storyline that we know of following Zakaev, Makarov, Price, Soap, Ghost, Roach, and the like isn't necessarily wiped out from existence, but instead our heroes will be telling a story of modern war, using the likeliness of Captain John Price, now portrayed by Barry Sloan and seemingly a handful of other old comrades. This year's package looks to be one of the most packed to the brim that we've ever received, boasting a full campaign unlike last year's Black Ops 4, a multiplayer experience that pushes the boundaries of what we know of Call of Duty, and a Spec Ops mode that looks to capitalize on the old and revitalize it as something new with a semi-open world experience for players to enjoy. All that with the potential of a free-to-play element reportedly coming sometime in early 2020 of Modern Warfare Battle Royale being developed by Raven? Well, it's looking to be a hell of a year for Modern Warfare, assuming those reprehensible microtransactions can stay at bay. Admittedly, not much is known about the campaign for now. As of scripting and recording this, we've seen a few trailers here and there that give off some basic pieces, but nothing outside of the generic, well, this is war, we have guns, we have bad guys, and something's gonna happen. Infinity Ward has definitely done a great job at keeping things under wraps. Unseen to the public, though, were three missions shown off at a press briefing in late May out in Los Angeles behind closed doors. I had the fortune of attending that briefing, to which we discussed here on the channel before, that we saw an attack on the public in the mission Piccadilly, an origin story of Farah and Hadir, two of our main characters that involve some brutal scenes, and the mission Safe House, in which Price and our main character Kyle Garrick raid a terrorist cell's hideout with their plans for future attacks. What we saw makes a strong case for believing this campaign will be truly gripping and jaw-dropping. There are plenty that made you consider the classic points that we've all become accustomed to, and then takes it a step further. But for now, outside of that, there really isn't much known about what we'll be doing. But what we do know is that it should be one for the ages. Multiplayer? Well, I'll be honest. This may be very well the most ambitious Call of Duty has ever been with multiplayer. From the rumored and leaked list of 40 weapons coming at launch, to the varying levels of play between 2v2, 6v6, 10v10, 20v20, 32v32, and upwards of 50v50, there is no shortage of what's to come. While maps have been limited in terms of play to what we've seen in the beta and a little bit exclusively to the multiplayer reveal, including in Nia Palace, there looks to be some memorable moments. Pushing the scope of what is Call of Duty is something that the game looks to do quite a bit, with Ground War being well and above any previous definition of Ground War in Call of Duty, offering that 30 CV 32 and up, and some of the most adrenaline pumping and addictive gameplay that I personally have experienced in a long while. 
Features like Killstreak's Specialist, Classic Weaponry from the original Modern Warfare series, and more are returning along with what I'm sure we all waited for, the Tactical Nuke makes its return as a 30 Killstreak and MP. Overall, while I don't think there's much more to say than the generic recap, I can say that I am truly excited to jump in and grind out the game. I had, throughout NDA playtime, the reveal event, the alpha, and the beta, a tremendous amount of fun that I hadn't in recent years. And to be able to get in and grind something out again fresh is something that I'm really looking forward to. Spec Ops this year looks to be something special for what's available. The big blemish on the record of what this game may offer at launch content is certainly going to be the fact that Modern Warfare won't be offering the survival variation of Spec Ops to Xbox and PC players until October 1st of 2020, nearly an entire year later. But for those that are looking for the rest of the package, Spec Ops offers a new feature called Operations, a new open worldish approach to Spec Ops that tasks you at launch with four major things to do to complete with your squads. If you're not super keen on the open world stuff or you just want to play traditionally just by yourself or with even friends, then no problem. You can still do some missions that will be coming as well, all while leveling up your content for MP as well as Spec Ops thanks to cross progression that has been enabled for launch as well. You'll be able to work on all your skills in one uniform manner. All this while being done what seems like the extension of a campaign, which will tell its own story and perhaps set up the inevitable sequel to the Modern Warfare Soft reboot. Another huge thing to note with Modern Warfare this year is the technical and post-launch feats it looks to bring. From day one, even when we were not allowed to talk about it, crossplay was a thing that is finally happening in Call of Duty. With the days of console wars being long gone, we can now finally have some unity and play with our friends who may not be on the same platform as us and instead come together and enjoy the games we love. Play with your friends on PS4, Xbox One, and PC, no real issues at all. Plus, not to mention the days of the season pass, gone finally after years of the archaic system in place. All post-launch content will be granted to players at the same time for free, including maps both new and classic. The possibilities are truly endless, and here's the hoping that optimism and positive outlook stays the same the entire way throughout. But that said, all we can do now is wait. And under two short, though really feeling long, weeks, we'll have Modern Warfare in our hands, our consoles, our hard drives, grinding away and experiencing a franchise many of us grew up loving once again. Modern Warfare looks to push the boundaries while reclaiming that love that many fans started out with and bringing back a potential demographic that they may have lost. What may have started as a simple sales tactic looks to create something truly great, if handled properly and with care. I know for myself, this franchise has been one I've adored for over a decade, so to be able to jump right back into the fray and experience a new variation of that classic, I couldn't be more excited. As we draw towards the start of a new chapter, we can't forget what brought us here, and with that, it will conclude the evolution of Modern Warfare. Do let me know your thoughts down below, share your fondest memory, your potential excitement for the upcoming title, whatever it may be about Modern Warfare, let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video though, do me a favor and hit that like button, and of course, if you're new, be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with all things Modern Warfare as we round into the new year and the new title coming up. If you'd like to stay connected with me a little further than just here on YouTube, follow me over on Twitter and Instagram, those links are down there in the description below. Well, let's end out of the way, thank you all so much for watching, my name is Nespresso, I'll see you guys later, take care, and peace.